Uh, good morning, everyone. How are you? It's great to be in Austin. Um, my name is Preet Bharara. Um, among other things, I used to be the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Um, I got fired. Uh, I, do, I do other things now. I teach law at New York University School of Law. I practice law at the Wilmer Hale Law Firm. And of course, I host the podcast that has my name in it. Stay tuned with Preet. So welcome to a live taping of the podcast. My very special guest, and very relevant guest in these times is Mark Leibovich. Um, and I'm excited, I'm excited for our conversation today. He is a longtime leading political analyst, journalist, and author. At the moment, uh, he's a staff writer at The Atlantic and a political analyst for NBC and MSNBC. Before joining The Atlantic, he spent 16 years at The New York Times, serving as the chief national correspondent for The New York Times Magazine. Before that, he wrote for The Washington Post. He also likes to write books. He's the author of five excellent books, including three New York Times bestsellers. We'll ask why two of them were not bestsellers. Um, and, and two of them were number one Times bestsellers, This Town and Thank You for Your Servitude. Uh, he's joined me before on the Stay Tuned podcast, as I often look to him to make sense of political news. So I'm thrilled to have him back for this session to talk about, you know, a slow news year, uh, which is presented by Atlassian. Mark, welcome. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, let's welcome Mark. So I, so I will, I will um, make one statement to the, to the group. Mark and I had dinner last night, and at first I thought maybe we'd discuss some of the topics that we'd be talking about here and, and tell him some of the questions, and I realized that would take all the freshness out of the conversation. So we, he ate his pork chop, I ate my fried chicken, um, and we didn't really preview any of this. So this will all come as mostly a surprise to you. There, there was nothing but uncomfortable silence throughout the entire dinner. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. Thank, thank God. A little handshake thank God the bar was open. Stage. It made it look like we were just meeting for the first time, <laughs> but it's not true. No, a great time was had by all. Yeah. So, so here we are. Um, there's some big picture points I want to discuss with you and get your views on. There's some things that happened this week, but, but the overall landscape is that um, the election and the rematch that nobody wanted is the one we're getting. And of course, people have pointed out, even though people on television and in print keep saying nobody wanted this, nobody wanted this, nobody wanted this, of course we did because we got to this point and this rematch by a democratic process, which def by definition means in some way we wanted it. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's true. I mean, we're here because this is what people wanted. Um, you know, obviously it's a flawed democratic process. It's also, it's a very limited democratic process because if you look at the numbers of people who vote in these primaries, it's, it's a tiny fraction, not only of the overall electorate, but also of the, of the national electorate. And as we've seen, um, you know, voters in states like Iowa and New Hampshire have disproportionate influence, and here we are. Having said that, um, I think it's possible to, by democratic process, anoint the two candidates that the, the trope says nobody wanted and still actually not really want it. Um, because, I don't know, I mean, I think democracy is broken for a lot of ways in a lot of ways that, that people have pointed out, but um, in some ways we get the democracy we want and hopefully we'll save it. So a couple of things happened this week, and then we'll talk about the race more broadly. I'll go in reverse chronological order. Okay. State of the Union was a couple of days ago. Um, lots of Democrats are saying that Joe Biden gave a, the performance of a lifetime, and he has quelled concerns about his age and about his vigor. Do you agree? I think he gave a really good performance. I, I watched it. I was pleasantly surprised. I was relieved as someone who wanted him to do well. I don't think he quelled concerns about his age at all. I think... Why not? If he gave a good speech. Because it's one good speech, and in the shelf life of our politics, it won't last. Immediately, Republicans... I mean, 
in that sort of incoherent way are saying that, oh, he was angry, he was a daughter, he, he, was, he was unhinged, of course. You know, it's kind of hard when you have no energy and are... Is he, is he low energy or high energy? Which yeah, that's right, pick one, right? But no, I mean, I also think, you know, as, as a lot of... Well, it, this is an obvious point, but I, I drove in yesterday from Houston to here, listened to talk radio, which I don't usually do, when I'm, except when I'm in rental cars going long stretches. And as you will be undoubtedly not surprised to hear, the talk radio uh, response, especially the conservative talk radio, which is really all you get here, and in most places when you're driving long distances, even in blue states, was incredibly negative on this. And these are the information filters that people exist in. Negative on what basis? They thought he was angry. They thought he told lies. They thought he was divisive, which I love. Right. They thought he did not bring us together. Unlike, I was really unlike the hoping other guy. that the president would bring us together last night, and boy, am I disappointed. I mean, it's comical. But It's like when... when uh when Trump supporters get upset when they claim that Joe Biden has trampled on norms. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. God, speaking of which, actually, and I came from Houston yesterday where I was watching Laura Trump be anointed as the vice chair of the Republican. Oh, yeah, we're going to get to that. Okay, we don't want to, I don't want to violate chronology here. So. Yeah. Although, by the way, if you're going to ask me about Katie Britt... You can't go back in time. The, the Katie Britt thing happened after the State of the Union, so reverse chronology would... Do, anyway... Sorry. You're being very difficult. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask you, so if you listen to talk radio, and if they were critical and negative about Joe Biden, what was the expressed sentiment about the rebuttal from Senator Katie Britt? Uh, eerie silence on the Katie Britt rebuttal, <laughs> at least on talk radio. I, I am amazed at how she continues to dominate uh, social media now 36 hours after her speech, which was bizarre in, in many ways. It was unprecedented, and it's been digested and continues to be digested in little clips, and uh, I think it probably was a disaster, but who knows? Was it as bad as people are saying? I actually think it was. I, I didn't see it live. I, I then started hearing about it, and then um, I was overwhelmed by the weirdness of it. I, I don't understand what the idea was. Um, I mean, it takes... Have, have you ever thought to yourself, I mean, and this is not a comprehensive statement, but the number of times that a rebuttal, both from the Democratic side and the Republican side, has kind of sucked, yeah. is a high number. It should, is. Should anybody, you know, there's a thing that, that happens in courtrooms sometimes, it's unusual, but sometimes a witness gets up and the witness is not that bad for you, um, and you, you're, it's your opportunity to get up and do the cross-examination. You say, Your Honor, we waive the cross. Right. Should they waive rebuttal sometimes? I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all, all you can basically, the best you can ask for is innocuousness and not to be noticed. I mean, I can't, can anyone remember, can you remember a good rebuttal? Like, what, what is a... I don't... The uh, anybody? The, um, there's going to be, a, uh, by the way, there's going to be an opportunity to ask questions the last uh, portion of the show, so think yeah. about those questions. Very hard ones for Mark. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, the ones you remember um, have, I mean, sometimes it's unfair. I mean, you know, Marco Rubio was mocked for having yeah. to drink water a couple times. So yeah, okay. We have water for you. We have water for, yeah, too. Actually, there's warm water and <laughs> cold water. Um, and um, letting you guys inside the kimono here. Um, and then there was the Bobby Jindal one, which was a little weird, but it wasn't that weird. I mean, it was kind of coherent once it got started. Yeah. And then there was this one. But, I mean, otherwise, I don't remember who did last year's rebuttal. A few minutes into the... Katie Britt rebuttal, I, I tweeted, better or worse than Bobby Jindal. And then as the minutes went on, it was unanimous. Really? Worse. Wow. Yeah. So do you think, I mean, so we can spend some time piling on, which we won't, but do you think that that performance means that she is no longer on the short list to be Donald Trump's vice president? I don't think it helped. I mean, I do think that, that you know, there, there is a school of thought that, like, look, this didn't matter. She had a bad night. She's new. But Donald Trump does not exist in a, in a world of fairness. I mean, he, he, tends, to, <laughs> he tends to just latch on to caricature, whether it's fair or not. Um, and I, I don't think he will, uh, I mean, if he was ever considering her, I don't think this will move the needle in her direction. So I, you know, I have an observation, and maybe it's an observation given, like, what I uh, do and what I have done. So... I don't believe, and I may have missed it, but I don't believe that Joe Biden, one time, even though he talked about Trump not by name, but as his predecessor, I don't believe he one time made reference to the fact that Donald Trump is under indictment in multiple places. 
And I understand the reason for that, and I like to talk about it, but it's kind of stunning, because you can imagine in any other reasonable political universe, if your opponent has been charged with serious crimes in multiple places, somebody might have chosen to add a line to the State of the Union, something like, you know, and how can you expect my predecessor to faithfully execute the laws of the land when he himself is accused of violating the law in four separate jurisdictions, state and federal, how can we have such a person return to the White House? Didn't say that. Does that tell you something about where we are? Because, I'm sorry, just the last point on that is, because people on the, on the left have been criticizing Republicans in the primary for not beating Donald Trump up with respect to the indictments. Well, you know, Joe Biden had a huge bully pulpit from which to do it, and he, he didn't do it either. I, I think that if he were to do it, that would have been the way to do it. I do think that the president, if, I mean, I don't, I don't pretend to know how he was thinking, but I, I would imagine he was thinking like this, which is if the president of the United States at his State of the Union mentioned this, it would absolutely perpetuate the notion that the president is behind this, yeah. that it is perpetuated, that, it, that, that, that the Justice Department is being dictated from the White House, which is absolutely not what you want. And, and look, people know this, I mean, at, at this point. I, I do think one thing that in this, a similar vein, not that similar, but it's kind of a different kind of uh, thematic thing, which he did yesterday in, I think it was Pennsylvania, is he talked about how basically the Trump domination of the Republican Party has made it okay to have six-year-olds raise their middle finger at the President of the United States, have people say, screw you or F you, I, I forgot, I don't, don't think Biden swore, but he, he was basically talking about the experience of walking down the street in a parade or something and being sworn at by complete strangers, which is not something that typically happened before Trump, basically. And, you know, six-year-olds, I mean, it is insane out there. He did talk about that yesterday. I was a little surprised he didn't, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't talk more about that in the future, but I do think that uh, the 91 indictments, while very compelling, especially if presented like you just presented them, is, is kind of a third rail for, for Biden. Yeah, it's just, it's just an interesting dynamic where in, in ordinary times, the fact that someone is accused of a crime is a political cudgel that the opponent would use. And here, it's neither a cudgel that can be used by um, adversaries within his party, right, because they have to thread a certain needle, um, nor is it one that can be used by the, the adversary. So he's kind of oddly, in terms of political rhetoric, insulated from attack about it. It's just an odd situation to be in. I'm not saying it shouldn't be that way, but it's yeah. odd. It, it is. I, I, think, I don't think it's insulated from attack, but I think by the president himself it is. I mean, I also think that it, it would be smart for Democrats to at some point keep bringing up the idea that do you really think it's possible for you to rig 91 charges against the former president of the United States? I mean, in however many jurisdictions? I mean, you think this is, you think that's how it works? I mean, explain to me what the innocent defense is for everything that he's been accused of, or at least two things. I don't know. Yeah, well, he's gotten lucky because there have been sideshows and issues with respect to, to some of those cases. Yeah. The first case uh, that may actually go to trial in Manhattan, uh, in, in state court there, jury selection starts shortly, March 25th. Yeah. Lots of people think that's the least strong as an evidentiary matter of the cases. What do you think happens if that case goes forward and it's a mistrial or an acquittal and the other three don't happen? I mean, you, you would know better than me, but I think, I mean, that, that is politically possible. Pol politically, I think it's kind of a godsend for Trump. I yeah. mean, I, I think uh, no matter what happens, he will declare it a witch hunt. I think, I think the fact that it's in New York, the fact that it's being, um, yeah, the, the fact that it's a case that most people kind of don't understand. I mean, yes, yeah, Stormy Daniels, it's salacious and, and everything. And, but, but I mean, that case has been, yeah, People know that case. They've, they've known it for years. It feels like old news. And I think Trump, if if it's if he's not found, you know, unambiguously guilty, will immediately say, "See, I've been exonerated again, fully." So he will go from you know an imperfect case in New York and and extrapolate to full exoneration as he does. I want to go back to the age question because I, I do you believe that that will still be a dominant theme in the in the election? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, do you think he addressed it? Separate and apart from the, uh, the quality of the speech or the energy of the speech, he did attempt to address it a little bit and talked about 
Yeah. What's important is not our age, but the age of one's ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think, was that effective? Uh, that was effective. I mean, I do think he should take it more directly and talk head on about, yeah, I'm old. I wish I were 61 and not 81. I get it. But I can do this job. I've proven I've done this job. I have a great team around me. Uh, and then pivot to his record. I, I think, yeah. look, it, it's, I, I hate to say this, but I mean, you can run the country at 81 years old. You can run it at 83 years old. I mean, the president is in some ways a figurehead. I mean, if more and more if he wants to be. I mean, the, 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 pres the, the presidency has operated on less than full capacity on many occasions. <laughs> and I think if he were self-deprecating about it, he would win a lot of points. You have written about the age issue and said, look, what's going on here on the part of Democrats and progressives, it's not just about age. And you said they have um, a little bit of rage. What do you mean by that? And what's the rate? Why would they be enraged by Biden? Because they don't want him to run. That has been backed up in poll after poll, strong majorities of Democrats. And but not, you're not saying disappointment. You're saying rage. Well, he, th there is a sense of bait and switch because he ran... Because it rhymes with age? Possibly. No, the, the bait and switch is that he, he ran explicitly, actually said, I'm sort of a transitional character, uh, tra candidate. Um, I see myself as a bridge to the next generation. I mean, these are lines that he probably wishes he uttered. He did not utter, but he said them in 2020. There was an expectation that he was kind of a one-time stopgap to deliver the country from a unique emergency of having Trump in the White House. And um, no, he didn't say it explicitly. I yeah. understand that. He has the right to change his mind. And, you know, I think part of the, the anger is that no Democrats have dared to challenge him other than yeah. Tim well, Phillips. So. There's, there's, there's one or two. Marianne Williamson, you know, with apologies to, to her and Dean Phillips. But no, look, I, I, think, um, I, I think at some point that will subside and it will probably come sooner rather than later and people will rally around him. Should he have announced at the start of his candidacy in 2020 or at some point earlier that he intended to be a one-term president? Because the, the, the cons of that are then you're a lame duck yeah. and you can't get anything done. But would, yeah. would that have helped this problem? He, he would say, I mean, his, his long-standing um, school of thought on this, going back to when he was vice president, is a politician is either on his way up or on his way down. And once you declare yourself irrelevant to the future, no matter how old you are, no matter how much people expect you to go away, you have basically taken yourself out of the game because politics fundamentally is a, you know, is a sort of upward momentum game and you want to be seen as someone who's part of the future. I, I don't, I mean, so that was, I think, his thinking. Um, I mean, obviously he got elected in 2020, so he didn't need to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it would have helped, but I mean, you know, I think a lot of people did assume that he would. I mean, it's like that, that old story of two runners taking a break in the woods yeah. and they see a bear coming. And uh, one guy starts putting on his sneakers and the first guy says, you can't outrun the bear. So I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you, right? That's Biden doesn't have to run fast or be, you know, Lincoln. He just has to be better than the other guy. Uh, the other um, chestnut here that Biden uses is don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. Yeah. Uh, he always attributes that to, I think, his dad or maybe his grandpa. He always so I'm certainly a relative. It's, he's always attribution, very important in the Biden family, apparently. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. No, it's important. It's like, you know. <clears throat> You're going, going back to 1988. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, what, that was completely, no, I did, that was not an illusion. Today. That was not the illusion. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, actually, no, it wasn't. It's like sometimes he attributes to Neil Kinnock or not. <sighs> See, now that was 1988. It was. That's what I thought you were doing. We're, um, we're, we're aging ourselves. That's what we're doing. Yeah. A few people are laughing knowingly, <clears throat> think, so they're aging. I think themselves. time is aging us, but anyway. It could be. Um, so la last point, perhaps, on this. There's a New York Times poll, I think with Siena, but I, I'm not sure, yeah. that suggested that, it doesn't suggest, it indicates that the enthusiasm level about Joe Biden among Democrats is 23%. One, do you buy that? Th two, how much of a problem is that? And three, should we believe polls anymore in the age of cell phones? Uh, I'll take the third first. I mean, polls, there's a big problem with polls. I mean, pr yeah. polls have been inaccurate, historically inaccurate, and, and also ineffective in, in reaching people, as, as you indicated. Um, and 
from what I can tell, just and I talk to a lot of pollsters a lot. I mean, they they are really struggling to get a grip on the electorate, in part because recent polling has really struggled to measure Trump's voters, the enthusiasm of Trump voters, the reliability of Trump voters. Sometimes overestimating it in in elections in which Trump is not on the ballot. Um, I think the best thing Democrats have going for them in all this sort of very uneven, to say the least, polling is that um, Trump in the actual primaries has underperformed his polling. So yeah. the, the polling of Donald Trump voters continues to lag behind or lag ahead of how he's been performing. Um, I also think it's worth noting that you know, the Times Siena poll came out a week ago. Democrats freaked, um, as, as they do, um, as they should, um, but it is one poll, and since then there have been four polls that have had Biden either even or in the lead. So it is a moment in time, the moment changes, and, and maybe the State of the Union did move yeah. the needle a little bit. <clears throat> so here's another data point that's maybe a little more substantive. Uh, going back a few that days. That wasn't substantive? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Um, okay. No, it's a substantive. Uh, let me ask the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Super Tuesday, um, and you know, you see all these reports, you know, Bush runs away to victory. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think there was really anybody of note, as you pointed out, running against him. And the data point I was referring to is um, in Minnesota, and particularly in Hennepin County, where Minneapolis was located, there was, I think, 19% or so not committed. So that's, some might argue, a protest vote against the incumbent president and presumptive nominee in 2024. That's not a poll that doesn't you know, um, yield a false result because of cell phone usage or cell phone not answering. Mm -hmm. that's, that's people going to the polls and voting a particular way yeah. in a democratic stronghold. How, pro how problematic is that? Uh, could be very problematic. Yeah. I mean, I think the two states where that really showed up a lot were, were Minnesota, as you mentioned, and Michigan. Yeah. Um, worse in Minnesota than Michigan. Worse in Minnesota, but, you know, yeah, and both are swingy states. I mean, Michigan more so than, than Swingy. Minnesota. Swingy. I mean, you know. You don't want to go swing. You don't want to swing. I mean, you don't want to lose Minnesota. How's that if you're a Democrat? Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, the Middle East, young voters, a lot of young voters in Minnesota, a lot of young voters in Michigan, especially around college campuses. And, look, I mean, these protests that you see around Gaza, around the Middle East, that, you know, you can't, they're happening everywhere a Democrat goes. I mean, even like AOC is getting heckled when she tries to go to the movie. I mean, these are real, this is there's real energy behind this. And I think Biden really, you know, would like it to go away as soon yeah. as possible. Well, what's he supposed to do? Because there are people, there are, there are people who are hawkish for Israel, yeah. who also think he's not doing enough. And he's, and he's over-rotating to the other side. I think that's what people are saying. And then he has the problem on the other side, as you mentioned. Is there, in fact, putting aside what's best for the Middle East and having a, an outcome that allows for the release of the hostages and peace um, and a, a long-term solution, putting aside what's you know, best on the merits for all of that, as a political matter, is it just an impossible needle to thread? Uh, yeah, it's one of those issues where you sort of say to yourself, wow, if I were president, I don't know what the hell I'd do. I mean, I mean, and beyond politics, it's like, I mean, ideally you would want to do what you think the right thing is. But I mean, you know, you don't know who your partners are. You, I mean, the facts on the ground change so quickly. The emotions are so high. Um, you know, and it's not like you can look back on any number of presidents who have perfected the Middle East issue. I mean, who have just <laughs> left it perfectly spotless and who have raised no it's ire. It's historically so easy, but Biden screwed it up. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, Carter, I guess, had a good Middle East. But no, the, the um, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't, I can't. Yeah. You're not, you know, not going to solve the problem have, for I us? I cannot solve the Middle East okay. for us. Okay. Let's, let's talk about so the other player that remained until a day after Super Tuesday, Nikki Haley. Um, was it politically smart long term for her to stay in the race solo against Trump through Super Tuesday? Uh, I think it was, I mean, I, th I think she could because she had money and she you know, worked basically for an entire year to get a two person race and a, and a clean shot at Trump. And I think, you know, she didn't, didn't get her very far, but in the last weeks, I mean, she actually spoke probably more truthfully than she had before. I think she probably dislikes Donald Trump quite a bit. I don't think her future in today's Republican Party is terribly 
uh, strong. I mean, I don't think this sets her up for being the automatic front runner in 2028. Why not? Because much of the She's the runner up. Sometimes in the past we've seen the last person standing ends up having a, a presumptively significant advantage the next time out. And, and, and as everyone in this room is aware, 2028 is free and clear on both sides. Yeah, I, I think given where the Republican Party is now, um, I, I would think that it, unless Trump stays in the White House after winning the White House, we have to always account for that, uh, the, you know, his heir apparent would likely be someone with MAGA credibility that he anoints, whether it's his son, his daughter-in-law, um, Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, Carrie Lake, someone like that. I mean, that's where the, the party is at this point. I mean, Nikki Haley is, um, you know, maybe she ran the best race she could. Maybe this was the only way she could have finished second. But she is widely despised by the vast majority of her party right now because, you know, she's crossed Donald Trump. And that's not a, a, that's not a recipe for success. Um, who do you think has a greater chance of being Donald Trump's vice presidential pick? Katie Britt or Nikki Haley? Katie Britt. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, because sometimes in hard-fought races, we've seen this before, you choose the runner-up. Not going to happen here. Yeah, I mean, you know, that would require a... a I mean, Donald Trump can, could not abide someone who he, he feels like has been disloyal yeah. to him. So, obviously, she got trounced in uh, every state, had a victory in the District of Columbia. Not Vermont. And, oh, in Vermont. She won yes. Vermont. That's yeah. right, and District of Columbia. Yep. Um, and in some of those states you know, 20 something percent voted for her. And those are people that one would presume are, are never gonna vote for Trump. Where do those voters go? They stay home, according to the people you talk to, or do they maybe come to Biden? Uh, a lot of them, if you believe, you know, like exit polls are even less reliable than other polls, but, um, or, or, you know, they're less reliable than actual, the actual numbers, they're not less reliable than other polls. Um, I, I think, you know, Biden could get a fair number of them. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them are Democrats anyway. A lot of them are independents. They voted in states where there was crossover. A lot of Democrats feeling that their vote for Biden didn't matter in the primary said, why not? And, you know, they decided that they would exercise their vote that day to try to make Donald Trump's life a little harder. So there was a lot of that. But no, it's, it's definitely a number that gets your attention. And it's, um, and, and if you believe what they've been telling pollsters and what Haley herself has been saying, it's, uh, these are not Trump voters necessarily at all yeah. in November. <clears throat> so now <laughs> the race is set, the rematch is on. I think, and I haven't confirmed this, but as far as I can remember, the rema this, this, the, the two-party, the two-person race is set earlier than any time I can remember. Is that right? Yeah, usually. I mean, usually there's a pretty clear nominee after Super Tuesday, but I think this seemed pretty set like after New Hampshire. Before that, right? And yeah. so now you have, we have a lot of months to go. Yes, we do. Is this gonna be boring? I don't think so. I think the stakes are too high. Um, I also think, you know, the variables need to play out. I mean, I think, you know, will there be a no labels candidate? I mean, is it exciting to watch while they try to like figure themselves out and find a candidate? Not to know, but it's not, bo but it's, it's not boring. It's look, well, Donald it, Trump has a lot of, you know, Do Donald Trump and boring usually are not in the same sentence. Yeah, that, that's true. I, I mean, you know, it's not boring to do any number of things that I would choose to do during the day other than pay any attention at all to what No Labels is doing. So in that sense, it's okay. not boring. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a delicate political situation here with both parties. I mean, uh, I think Donald Trump's, the, the court, you know, variable is, is going to be endlessly compelling to watch. I mean, it's not endlessly um, uplifting, but I mean, it's all... Yeah, I think. I mean, like eight months is, is an eternity, as people will say. Yeah. Do you expect there to be, you know, polling reversals up and down, Biden in the lead, Trump in the lead? Do you think it'll be remain fixed for a while? And I point out, going back to the, the earlier moment when we dated ourselves, but you know, the first campaign I ever sort of felt like I paid attention to, in my formative years was 1988, mm -hmm. and I do remember still. I may be off by a point or two, that. At, at a late point in the campaign, I think after the conventions, Michael Dukakis, if you'll remember him. 17 points. 17 points up. Yeah. And, um, and it wasn't close at the end. 
It wasn't. Do you expect to see that kind of seesaw this year or no? I don't think that wide. I mean, I think it's a, it's a much more uh, deadlocked nation than it was in 1988. Um, by the way, one of the 10 states, Michael Dukakis won, West Virginia. Now the, yeah. one of the Trumpiest states in the country. So funny how this all swings. Um, no, but, you know, the, the polls will, will, will go. I mean, that, but that is emblematic of the fact that, that polls definitely are very volatile, and they were volatile then, and they're volatile, volatile, volatile now. Um, and I, I think if you believe poll, uh, poll respondents, I think if Trump is actually convicted, that could actually be um, something that, that affects the dynamic of the race. In his favor? No. If he's convicted... I say that, I wasn't being facetious, because you yeah. know, a lot of people have said, contrary to what the intuitive sense was, and again, I don't think these decisions were made for these purposes, that he was kind of stagnating and losing favor within his party in the GOP. And some people point to a trend line in the polling that suggests that he started trending upward after the first indictment from yeah, Alvin Bragg. among so, Republicans. This was a Republican primary. Yeah. So, well, I mean, so do, do you think on the progressive side, there are people who are like, I'm voting for Trump, but let's see if he gets convicted? No, but I think on the independent, I think it's going to be, in so much as there's a middle... I, I guarantee you that independent and even Republican swing voters are not going to be impressed with a conviction of the president because, I mean, at a, at a certain point, the, whatever benefit you got from the idea that, that the president is being uh, targeted is, I mean, that exists in a real hardcore area of the, of the Republican Party, which you know, had decided their vote a long time ago. So among Republicans, sure, there's, there's indications that, that that helped him, but I don't think in, in a general election um, group. You came on the podcast about a year and a half ago <clears throat> in part to talk about the book you wrote that was in part about the grip that Donald Trump had on the GOP. How much tighter is that grip today, or is it the same? Um, it's tighter. I mean, there, there was, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing the levels of, it's almost perverse, the, the degree to which Republicans who, I, I focused in the book, and I'm focusing now still on the Republicans who know better, the Mitch McConnells, the Chris Sununus, who was one of Nikki Haley, governor of New Hampshire, who was one of Nikki Haley's biggest supporters, said some of the most nasty stuff about Trump. But you know, all along said I will support the nominee. Uh, I will support the nominee, and of course, yesterday endorsed him. McConnell endorsed him. Um, I mean, Laura Trump. So at this Houston thing, she gets up and she says, "This isn't about Democrats and Republicans. This is about good versus evil." Um, so it doesn't leave a lot of room for you know bringing the country together. <clears throat> um, what was that? She was introduced. I, I saw a clip. So forgive me if I get this slightly off. Where the person was saying about Laura Trump and um, justifying her appointment. You know, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Yeah. What on earth does that mean? It means that she married Donald Trump's son, and Donald <laughs> Trump wants her to be vice chair of, the, uh, of, of his campaign. And, you know, there's a good chance uh, they could use RNC funds to pay off his legal bills. You mentioned Mitch McConnell. Yeah. It's a complicated figure. Yeah. Um, is his withdrawal from leadership at the end of the year a sign of complete and total capitulation of the GOP to Trump? Or yeah. Or something else? Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been a, the signs have been there for a long time. I mean, what's interesting about that is the, the day McConnell said he was stepping down um, was, I think, either also the day or maybe the day before the Supreme Court basically ensured a delay in the, in the Jack Smith, in, in the January 6th um, case. And, you know, Mitch McConnell basically ensured that, that three of Donald, you know, basically he stole two, or I don't know, stole is probably not the right word, but he ensured that two of the three um, justices that Donald Trump appointed would, would get on the bench. So Neil Gorsuch and Amy Coney, Coney Barrett. I mean, uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh was sort of, it was not, it was within his term. So, I mean, he was essential, McConnell was essential to Donald Trump's legacy, to really helping, uh, making sure that he would not, at least at any time soon, 
B, held accountable by the legal system. And then there was all these statements from like the House Freedom Caucus by like Marjorie Taylor Greene just trashing um, McConnell on the way out the door. I mean, that's sort of how it works now. It's like, hey, thanks, buddy. Um, and, you know, it's part of the meanness. It's part of, you know, what we've come to expect from Trump, so it wasn't surprising. But I think the juxtaposition of this all happening within a few days uh, never really gets old. You have written about this phenomenon, and you said somewhere that recent events have shown a, quote, new level of capitulation, end quote, and that Republicans in their service of Donald Trump are acting as if, something like this, acting as if they're, they're joining, a grocery line, joining a grocery line. Yeah. What do you mean by that? There's a, a, almost a banal nature to following along. Um, there is, I mean, the nature of capitulation, the nature of complicity, the, the nature of just conspiring with someone that you know better, at this point, no one really thinks about it anymore. The context of, of the grocery line line was just senators who in the past have said, boy, that was this person is terrible, January 6th was terrible, it's time to move on. Just tossing out statements on a Saturday, I think I was talking about Shelley Moore Capito, the quasi-moderate senator from West Virginia, Republican, just endorsing uh, John Thune, John Barrasso, John Cornyn, senator from Texas, all, all who are vying to be in Republican leadership, all quietly have endorsed Trump. I mean, it's just kind of a quiet going along at this point, which if you think about it, is the nature of quiet capitulation, which is what the MO within the Republican Party has been and, and really the key to survival. <clears throat> Beyond McConnell stepping down as leader, we have the retirements of Senator Sinema, Senator Manchin, Senator Romney, and people, some people like them, some people don't, some people like some of them. But they represent something in terms of um, you know, centrism, I think mainstream centrism, if I can say that. Sure. H how, does, how do their retirements from public life, or from office at least, fit into this narrative that you've been discussing? Yeah, I mean, I think, one of the interesting things about that is none of them probably could have gotten elected. None of them could yeah. have gotten through primaries in their states. And and look, everyone you just mentioned, um, you know, a lot of people have very negative feelings within their parties, certainly about Romney, about cinema, but... And Manchin. And, and Manchin, <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of right. Democrats are saying, good riddance to Joe Manchin. Uh, this is how deals get made. This is where the center is. I mean, the center, to be in the center demands a lot of friction in many ways. And there are very few people in this environment who have managed to survive that. Um, you know, Susan Collins of Maine is, is a rare exception. She got reelected, I guess, in 2020. Um, you know, a couple of others, but I mean, but I mean, I mean, you know, Maine's kind of a unique state. But but no, I mean, I think what you're going to see is just domination by the base of both parties, and fewer and fewer people who are willing to reach across the aisle. Where, so it's interesting. We say all this, and we're talking about these people leaving office. Where do you put Joe Biden in 2019 and 2020 on that spectrum? Isn't some people say that's the reason he won because he's a little bit like a moderate centrist type Democrat? Oh yeah. Yeah. Compared to today, I mean, today, that's what he is. I mean, he's definitely... So how much evolution has there been in the political sphere between 2020 and 2024? Oh, a lot. A lot. I mean, as people, I mean, as, you know, they're, they're the, the, the people on the extremes who, who not extreme, I mean, it's, it sounds too pejorative, but I mean, look, it's the people who get attention, who people who, you know, the Ted Cruz's of the world, the Josh Hawley's of the world, um, I mean, there's a whole strategy around just getting as much attention as possible, throwing the most uh, incendiary bombs as possible. And you, the idea is to get clicks and get on TV and so forth. Joe Biden is not part of that school. And, you know, again, he's a dealer. You've also written about this phrase that particularly on the left, people use rhetorically, um, which is they look at the country and they look at how polarized we are and, and they look at threats to democracy, and they say, this is not who we are. And you say some version of, well, of course it is, because yeah, because it is, because we're doing these things. And you say, when people say this is who we are, it begins to sound more, much more like a liberal wish than a true assessment of the country. It, it, it's true. I mean, look, every time something horrific happens 
people, I mean, after January 6th, after, um, you know, Donald Trump says some unspeakable thing about someone else, everyone said, oh, this isn't who we are. Michelle Obama used to say it all the time. Um, a lot of people said it, um, you know, I think actually at January 6th. I mean, a lot of Republicans have said it. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think America has to get their head around the idea that one of our two major parties is, is following you know, Donald Trump into, you know, and they will support him no matter what. I mean, this is someone who left office four years ago, three and a half years ago, um, with 25,000 National Guard troops guarding the city from his own supporters. And, you know, a good portion of the country wants more of that. And that is who at least a big portion of us are. And, you know, the word are, this is going to sound very metaphysical, but um, in a democracy, it's a very messy notion, right? And a lot of different components get to add up to the who we are. And, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's pretty messy along the way. What's this campaign going to be about? We have eight months, so maybe it'll be about multiple things depending on what month we're talking about. But it, it's going to be about democracy, is it going to be about policy? Is it going to be about grievance? And second question, which, what should it be about? Uh, I think it'll be all those things. I think it'll be about abortion. I yeah. think it'll be about age. I think it'll be about um, things that we have no idea, you know, things that we can't predict. I think uh, there will be serendipity behind it. I, I honestly... Uh, the, the question I probably dread getting more than anything is, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, I, well, I was, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, um, I mean, there's there's part of me that thinks that you know, eventually things will calm down and the incumbent Joe Biden will be reelected, and that's usually what happens anyway when yeah. a president runs for reelection. And Donald Trump has extremely high negative ratings. Uh, people, I think, underestimate the level of revulsion there is out there for him. But look, I mean, he has proven incredibly durable. His supporters have proven incredibly loyal. And, you know, we all remember 2016. And, um, you know, the country hasn't been the same since. And we're still in that country. <clears throat> why, why isn't the theme, one of the themes that Nikki Haley struck and some other Republicans like Chris Christie and others struck, why doesn't it actually have any resonance? And it's, it's not about ideology necessarily or um, policy, but about the lack of winning. I mean, for a person who built his brand on winning, you can get tired of winning. Boy, there's been a lot of losing, right? Yeah. 2018, 2020, 2022, potentially in 2024, Nikki Haley was right that she pulled better against Joe Biden than Donald Trump. It seems like an odd... It seems like an odd dynamic where, you know, put aside what the other people tell you, you have real data that shows that when that's your guy, you lose. I mean, I guess the caveat to that is that the 2020 election was stolen. And so, so, so that's the mirage that people use to justify the loss. So it, it's kind of like Donald Trump is kind of the political version of that game, heads I win, tails you lose, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's a really good question. I mean, I think I would say two things. I mean, one, Trump, uh, I mean, yes, he, you know, he won the 2020 election. He won it big. Um, his endorsement record is impeccable. Everyone he endorses gets elected. I mean, it's a blatant lie, and the record bears that out. But when he says it, it's true for a huge portion of the population. Um, the other thing is the, the people, and, and this is really my hobby horse here, it's the people who know better. It's the people, the Republican Party's putative leaders who could stand athwart him, um, who could stop waving the white flag and actually give a counter argument to bring a level of sanity to the Republican Party that he has taken away. They, these are people who are not in danger of losing. I mean, I think the average Republican is not losing because of Donald Trump. Yeah. They, need to, they need Donald Trump's supporters to get elected. Mitch McConnell was there at an inflection point after the second impeachment trial. Yep. And had he behaved differently and wanted to shepherd um, votes in a particular way, and had he voted in a particular way, do you think he regrets not doing that? That's a, I don't, I don't, I don't know. 
I have not looked. You at should ask him. Mick, Mick, Mitch McConnell's soul. The regret question. I mean, he certainly. You could. have a drink with Mitch McConnell. What's that? <laughs> yeah. It just reminded me of that. Yes. My favorite Obama joke. Oh yeah, you um, go have a beer with people. Like have a beer. With, yeah, have a beer with. Yeah, Mitch you do it. You have a beer. With if Mitch only McConnell. you had gone and had a beer with. That was a good line. Um, Obama, underrated comedian, by the way. He had really good delivery. Um, McConnell, I, I, you know, look, he, first of all, I agree with you. He could have actually gotten that done. I mean, if there were 10 Republicans voted for uh, conviction, you needed, what, seven, eight more? I mean, he could have delivered them. It's just an odd, I keep saying odd dynamic. It is an odd M- dynamic. Mitch McConnell clearly despises Donald Trump. Yeah. Kevin McCarthy, notwithstanding what he did later, despised Donald Trump, said so in various versions, probably now does again because... You know, yeah. he's thrown to the wayside. But it's too busy vying for... Ted a Cruz, yeah. Josh Hawley, J.D. Vance said all these things and they've all reversed themselves. I mean, one could speculate that even the three justices he put on the Supreme Court don't have any love or fondness or deep abiding respect for Donald Trump. I don't know. Yeah. But it is peculiar when you have so many members of his party who are vastly powerful leaders... You can presume they feel a particular way and they let it go, like joining a grocery line. Like what? Like joining the grocery line. Right. Um, I wouldn't underestimate the power of, of two things, cowardice and self-perpetuation. I mean, I think, look, if, if Lindsey Graham were to have kept up his you know, criticism of Donald Trump that he you know, famously um, unleashed in 2016, there's no way he would have been reelected. Yeah. Ever. He would have gone the way of Lynn, Lynn Cheney. They all, they all would have gone. They all would have gone away. Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney. Lynn Cheney, too, actually. Yeah. She but, also didn't get elected. Also didn't get elected. <laughs> no, I mean, look, the, 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 I mean, a lot of people really want to keep their jobs, especially like Lindsey Graham. Lindsey That's, Graham. by the way, a big problem, I think, yeah. if I can just editorialize for a second. Sure. In, for, for political appointees and for politically elected people. If you want to keep your job above everything else, it causes a lot of problems. It's my public service announcement as one who didn't keep his job. No, I mean, self-perpetuation is the single most important dynamic in Washington. I also wouldn't underestimate uh, avoidance of the hassle of being picketed and having death threats and things like that. I mean, I do think that literal fear of one well's well-being is now a much bigger consideration than it was um, fairly recently. So that's a very important point you make. And I, by the way, I want to open up to questions in just a couple of minutes after this question. So fear of violence is a real thing. Mm-hmm. And I, there was an article in the past few days about how members of the bench, judges in this country, have just figured that it's part of the job now, part of doing business as a robed jurist, that there will be death threats and there will be concerns about violence feel that in the legislator, legislature and other places. Do you think that is a fear and a worry in the, in the press and in the media for, for their own safety? Do you ever fear for your safety? Sure. I mean, I, I would say when I started, when at the New York Times, when Trump came into office, I mean, he could just come and go as you please. When I left the New York Times, or when Trump left office, or actually it was COVID, so. In, by, in, by 2020, we had three armed guards in our building. We had constant threats. Uh, it's been true of a lot of my colleagues. And it's, like, as you mentioned, it's true of the bench, it's true of staffers, it's true of people uh, who defy Trump, in, in, especially within the party. Um, and I, you know, I just want to point out that, I mean, this is really the definition of authoritarianism. It's, it's uh, politics. It, it's persuasion not by politics, not by um, negotiation or persuasion or anything. It's, it's just brute political threat and violence. 